Hello everyone, this is Elizabeth Leroux here, Chair of Migraine Canada, and today I'm very excited to have a special guest. Shelley Duval has won the first prize for the annual Migraine Moment short movie contest of the American Migraine Foundation. Um, and so I'm very glad to have her here to discuss about her movie and also her vision of migraine care in Canada. Welcome, Shelley. Thank you for having me. And so um, uh, I, uh, I just wanted to just maybe start by uh, saying a few words about yourself. Sure, great. Um, so I, I'm Shelley. I live in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, and um, I, uh, I'm a pharmacist. And um, I have had chronic migraine for the past three years. Um, my first migraine happened probably when I was a kid, but it was not diagnosed. But thinking back, I, I do remember having one very, very young. Um, and so the past three years especially have been a big challenge for me uh, dealing with, with chronic migraine. So uh, it led to me, um, I guess, getting a little bit more involved in terms of advocacy. And uh, recently, um, this winter, there was a, an advertisement to participate in this film contest, and I thought it would be a really interesting way to, to do something. So that's why I'm here today. Excellent. So I, I watched the movie. I really enjoyed it. And I invite the viewers to go on our website, or uh, you can, they can look for it actually pretty easily on Google by looking for the annual uh, Migraine Moment movie contest or on YouTube also. And we also link to it on Migraine Canada. So what uh, what were you really uh, hoping to focus on or what did you want the viewers to take from this movie when you designed it um well i really wanted to um to create a medium that would help me to really talk about my brain with my own entourage so i mean for sure i wanted to participate in the contest but it was also really to help me personally because i found that i had opened up about my struggles i mean with my husband my parents and couple of my very close friends but uh, really in general I it was something I didn't want to talk about and I feel like there's kind of a lot of stigma that surrounds migraine people just don't really understand it and they think that it's just a headache so when you suffer to the extent that I do and that a lot of people do there's just not a whole lot of understanding about that so I, I thought that making this movie would be kind of a way to show my story without um, actually having to talk about it. <laughs> so it was kind of like uh, a way to maybe start conversation in a way that would ease me into it. Um, so uh, basically I thought that the medium of animation would be really interesting to use as well because um, it would allow me to relay my experience in a bit of a lighter manner um, and convey, I guess, through the animation, things that can't really be said in words to allow people to really visualize um, what it's like to live with migraine. Um, so in my movie, there's a, a little monster called the migraine monster who is he's tethered to me throughout my life. And um, he's really like shackled to my leg, holding me back. He's like a dead weight. And that really represents what it's like for me to, to live with chronic migraine is even on the days where I feel well, there's always this sort of looming little monster that is threatening to, to come to life and, and to attack. Um, so um, I did think that it was, it was fun a little bit to represent him that way. He is a little bit cute despite himself, which um, brings a bit of uh, lightness to the conversation because I find a lot of people when they're talking about their experience, they focus entirely on the negative aspects of migraine. And obviously there is mostly negative <laughs> with migraine, but um, when you're talking about someone with chronic migraine, I was having 25 days of migraine per month. So that was my whole life. And um, there were a lot of other things in my life at that time too, despite the migraine. So I wanted to represent a little bit of that duality and show in the movie that there were other things in my life. I had my friends, my family, my coworkers who were very supportive. I was really lucky to have that. And I was still able to do my pastimes, um, like skiing and the big sphere, but I had to just adapt it to my new life. So um, yeah, it's really, I thought animation would be a, a cool way to show that. And I'm lucky that I have a really close friend of mine who I collaborated with, who's an excellent artist. So 
together, we were able to make it happen. Yeah, I was very impressed that you could get the uh, the animation done because it's it's not that easy to find people to do that. And I I, I really received it the way you you designed it that it's there everywhere. But sometimes you know you just have to you have to live your life. And uh, um, I I really like the way that you uh, described your journey. Also trying the medication. There's a sequence I. Uh, particularly liked uh, where you have the wheel of fortune can you tell us a bit more about this section yeah so <laughs> the spinning wheel um this kind of came to me as a as really what it's like when you're in a doctor's office or even just making decisions for yourself about what you should do next because um as a migraine patient um especially chronic migraine it's really hard to treat a, a lot of the treatments just don't work and um Sometimes it'll work for one person, but it's not going to work for the other. So it really, it's a big process of trial and error. And what I find is you need to kind of always be balancing uh, like the benefits and the disadvantages of each treatment. So um, there's for sure the side effects uh, that um, for me, I've gone through like really horrendous ordeal with side effects with different medications. Um, to the point where route net right now, I'm not actually taking any medications, but we'll, we'll see for the future. Um, and then there's also the risk of, uh, with certain of the more acute uh, treatments that you could develop medication overuse headache or secondary headaches. So um, often when you're living with chronic migraine and it's not well controlled, you do fall into that sort of pattern where it's like, okay, do I treat this migraine? Do I not? Do I suffer through it? Do I treat it and then risk having like to pay for it later? So it is really like a, a wheel that you're constantly spinning and seeing where it's going to fall and that day what choice you're going to make. Um, so I mean, that's, that's kind of how it's like day to day. And then certainly it's sort of extended into when you're speaking with your doctor or your specialist. Um, they want to help you and they're offering you all these different treatments, but still at the end of the day there they can't guarantee it's going to work and there's no panacea so uh it's uh it's an it kind of made me feel a lot like a hamster where i was just being like things were being i was being experimented on so it's not, yeah, it's not a nice feeling yeah for me being on the doctor's side after years and years of seeing you know many patients i i fully get it because you you start you know you you want to help so much and then your patients come back to you and no, they had side effects or it didn't work and it's not their fault. It's just the drugs are not necessarily working for everyone. Uh, and we, we also advise our patients to avoid medication overuse. But what do you do as you, as you say? I mean, do you not treat? And then you end up in your bed for three days. So for migraine patients, there's a lot of a, being caught between a rock and a hard place and having to find a graceful way to, to try to cope with all that. But um, I think um, now we can switch to uh, another uh, topic, which is the, uh, the migraine care in Canada. Um, so this, this contest was based uh, on the American Foundation. But here in Canada, um, the state of uh, access to care is not perfect. So uh, for viewers, I asked uh, Shelley, I mean, what, you're a pharmacist, you have migraines, and I'm a neurologist, and I also have migraines. So we wanted to discuss a little bit about items or things that are uh, important for migraine care. And so Shelly, you came, you came up with those four topics that fully, fully align with what I also uh, have concerns about. So um, you listed improving the importance of the uh, primary care, the uh, importance of having access to um, a headache specialist or a headache clinic, uh, and then um, how difficult it can be to go to the emergency department and spend some time there. <laughs> <laughs> and not getting necessarily the treatment you need. And then finally, uh, how people with migraine don't necessarily have access to the treatments they need and how sometimes they are disabled, but for some reason, uh, this disability is not recognized. So let's start with the first one that is the access to the, uh, the, the primary care, how, how you're managed when you deal with family doctors. And, and please, family doctors out there, don't uh, many family doctors are doing their very best, but what are the challenges there and how do you think we can make things better? Mm -hmm. 
there's a lot of challenges. I mean, at least in Quebec, access to a primary care physician is a little difficult. Sometimes the wait list can be very, very long. So there's a lot of people who don't even have a family physician. So they're left going to walk-in clinics or to the emergency room when they need care. Um, but I mean, starting with the topic of actually having a family doctor who can care for you, I'm very fortunate that my family doctor has been fantastic and really kind of held my hand throughout all of this, which is great and referred me to the, the good resources that I needed. Um, but a lot of people don't have that. And as a pharmacist, it has become more and more obvious to me throughout the years because um, I can get a patient sometimes who comes in with a prescription for a tryptan medication, which is um, one of the acute treatments. Um, and uh, I'll go to counsel them and it'll come out during our conversation that they're actually suffering from chronic migraine. You know, they have migraines 20 days a month and it's been happening for years. And this is the first time that they've consulted for whatever reason, maybe part of the stigma or they just didn't think that anyone could help them. And they came out of the doctor's office after like a two minute consultation with a medication just to treat their attacks which like to me is a bit insane that like you can uh, not be offered a prophylactic treat treatment when you're having chronic migraine, but also that other methods were not discussed, like in terms of other things you can do, diet, um, regulating your sleep cycle, uh, modifying your exercise, um, doing like any kind of psychological based treatments. Um, I mean, there's a whole host of different things that, that migraine patients can try to help. And usually it's a combination of these factors that's going to work. So, I mean, it's sad to me that that person uh, tried to reach out for care and just kind of, and didn't even know that any of this was out there. So as a pharmacist, I definitely take it upon myself to, to try and educate them with those things. And also if I see that there's room for a prophylaxis, I will get in touch with their doctor and suggest something. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that pharmacists can do as well. But in terms of the primary care physicians who are not, I guess, stepping up and, and doing, um, I guess, uh, the, the job that needs to be done for these patients, I, I think there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, and I know uh, with you uh, previously when we, we had talked a little bit, we talked about the need for sort of that interdisciplinary approach to migraine care. So. Um, maybe having doctors and pharmacists and maybe even nurse practitioners collaborating and um, seeing if, uh, uh, if we can even sort of um, create maybe a, a position like a migraine educator, uh, yeah. someone who yeah. would be specialized in that and who could, uh, doctors could refer the patient to them if they don't have the time or the resources to provide the adequate follow-up. Um, so I think that's a great idea and even maybe a, uh, having a special like continuing, educa uh, continuing medical education uh, credit course for primary care physicians that they could do if they're interested in getting more involved in migraine and learning what they can do on the, on the first line to, to help people. Yeah. So I think all in all, like um, there, there's some room for improvement there. <laughs> I think we agree. And over the years, um, it's, it's funny to me because I, I'm so passionate about my migraine care that I, I dedicate a lot of time to it, but we have to realize that family docs sometimes, so first they're not trained a lot. They don't receive a lot of information. So that's the first thing. And then as you say, even if they know what to do, sometimes they don't have the time to provide all this counseling that is very important. I, I cannot imagine a person having five minutes conversation. Uh, and so to, to cover for that lack of time, maybe having allies, uh, the pharmacists, the nurses, could be a good idea. So I think uh, there are many of those projects that we can work on, but um, it's, it's for diabetes and asthma, it's done already. So mm -hmm. let's, let's get it done for migraine. That's another chronic, even if in the occasional form, it's, it goes over the lifetime. So my wish would be for any person with migraine um, to, to just receive basic information to start with and then, and then be aware of options and all the options, not only the medications, but let's say that you started your journey and you have occasional migraines and things are controlled. That's great. But what if you need a headache specialist? I mean, what, what, what has been your experience with finding a headache specialist or a headache clinic? Um, well, it was, a, it was definitely a long road. I had been referred to general neurologists before um, and uh, 
they were able to start some treatments for me, but nothing was really working too much. And I decided like I really wanted to see a headache specialist when I found out there was such a thing. <laughs> and um, so uh, I applied or I asked my family doctor to help me uh, like get the paperwork rolling and everything to get into the uh, migraine clinic at the shin, um, which is uh, one of the only specialized clinics that we have here in Quebec. So um, I had to wait quite a long time to get in there. And we're talking about months, if not years, of waiting lists to get in. And during this time, um, you have to remember that we're having 20 to 25 migraines per month here. <laughs> we're vomiting every day and like it's life is not good where we can't work. So <laughs> it's um, that's a really long time to wait when you're suffering so much. And you, I think like a lot of migraine patients, myself included, put so much hope into finally getting into to a clinic like this and getting someone who truly understands migraine, like yourself, who's ultra specialized in this and really interested because um, a lot, I find like a, one of the big problems is that there's just a lack of interest, maybe even within medicine in, in migraine. So um, it's it's very exciting for us to have access to, to neurologists um, and a, a whole team really who, who love to do this and who are interested in helping us. Um, so you have, to wait, you have to wait two years for it, right? I remember um, I worked, I used to work at, at, at this clinic mm -hmm. and our pile of consultations was humongous. Um, we, we, we were desperate to see like we had a, a year waiting uh, at least. And that's not uncommon. Across Canada, there are not many academic centers providing help for people with migraine. Um, and one of the issues is that, and I'll say it, you know, because I'm a neurologist, uh, is that in neurology, headache medicine is, is the poor child of neurology. It's not something that has evoked a lot of interest or funding or research. And so the career opportunities in many academic departments are very limited. Uh, there are a few centers uh, that are uh, that have been very innovative and they have taken the leadership on headache. But for many neurology residents, I mean, you'll have just a few hours of talks and a few hours of clinic and that's it. But when you arrive in the, we the real world, headache is 25% of your consults. So it's, and there are so many people with chronic migraine who need expert care. So there's really something to, to be done there. Um, to correct this waiting list, but also uh, it, it's, it's, it doesn't mean because you go to a clinic, you will find immediate relief, right? As, as you, you've probably seen. So a lot needed there. And then another unfortunate situation sometimes happens is when you have this super bad attack and then you just have to go to the emergency department. So has, I don't know if that happened to you and how it went and what you could envision about this situation to make it better. Well, the, the first time I had to go to the emergency was about a year and a half ago when I was at my worst with the chronic migraines. And um, I had this migraine that just wouldn't stop. It was intractable. I had had it for about three or four days. And um, I really, in my particular case, the most disturbing part is the vomiting. So I was just so dehydrated that I, I couldn't, like I was starting to be not really responsive. <laughs> so um, it was it was scary. So we um, we went to the emergency department and um, I thought like, you know, given the amount of pain I'm in and the fact that I, I'm not really like all there at this point, I figured I'd be seen pretty quickly, but that's not the case. Um, I was triaged by a nurse and who kind of confirmed I was not dying. And then I was put into the, you know, the back of the, the waiting list. So um, I think I waited about four hours in a, a bright emergency room uh, full of people, noises, and um, having to run to the bathroom every few minutes to, to throw up. And it was really traumatic. Honestly, it made my headaches so much worse. And finally, when I, I got into to a room, I was able to lie down and at least it was dark. So that was a, a big plus. And um, at that point, like I, I, uh, I sort of had an idea, obviously, what type of medications I was getting because I, I do work in pharmacy, but I had never had them myself. So I was a little bit worried about getting them. So there's a lot of anxiety for a lot of different reasons going to the ER, a lot of unfamiliarity and a lot of things in the environment that make it a lot worse for a migraine patient. 
Um, and then there's the interaction with the ER doctor. And again, uh, not to put any blame on them personally, because I know that they have like a really huge workload, tons of patients. It's the middle of the night. I mean, there's only so much that they can really do when you show up at the emergency. But that being said, um, being allowed a maybe one or two minute consultation with the doctor before the nurse comes, puts the IV in and everyone leaves for four hours, that's also very traumatic. And um, I would say that I didn't really get that much relief, but at least I was getting the, the, um, the IV fluids. <laughs> So yeah. I was able to, you know, function and get rehydrated, but um, that migraine did take a, at least another 12 to 24 hours before it, uh, before it broke. So um, I really think that I, that that was a very traumatic experience for me, like really traumatic. And I never wanted to go back to the hospital again. I ended up having to go twice more uh, to the ER and both times were equally bad. So I, I think there is, um, there's a lot to be said about like improving that kind of situation. I know when we were speaking earlier, we had talked about a few different measures. I don't know if you wanted to bring them up or. Yeah, I mean, I, I worked, this is appalling, right? When you think about the worst place on earth, apart from a rock concert, is probably an emergency department when you have a migraine. And the only thing you want is peace and quiet, but you just can't stay home because you're dehydrated. And it's going on. Uh, I, I did my headache fellowship in France, in Paris, where they have a dedicated uh, place in the eMERGE for a migraine in the special center, where it's, you know, the lighting is low, the nurses are trained, we have infusions ready. And we were, we used to see 60 patients per day with different types of headaches. Um, and, and that was very much appreciated. But this is a very unique center. I'm not aware of any else in the world. Um, so your experience that you just shared uh, has been shared by patients in my office, on forums. This is a key need, and we, we should really work on that. And of course, the eMERGE is, is a place where, you know, people die and there's all kinds of catastrophes. So, um, but I think considering the fact that there's always at least one or two people with migraine in the eMERGE, it wouldn't be too much to ask to have a dedicated place. And also just a little bit of respect because... You, you went through a lot, but some patients go there, they're treated as drug seekers, you know, um, and, and I've heard comments, but we're very rude to patients, you know, what are you doing here? You're losing my time. You should be at home. It's only a headache, la, la, la. So there's, there's probably some collaboration to, to do with the emergency doctors and nurses, um, and also trying to, to get some good approaches to prevent going to the eMERGE, right? Mm -hmm. So a good, an important piece, I think there's, there's work to do. And the last one you mentioned was the question of uh, medication coverage and also recognition of disability. Because sometimes you get a doctor, you get the medications, you do all you can, you have this pristine lifestyle, but despite all efforts, both sides, the migraine is still going on and very disabling. So um, I don't know if you, you went up to that point and if you, uh, you, you had some interaction with the disability world, but it's not an easy place to be, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that can be just as traumatic as the ER in a different way. Um, so yes, again, it was about a year and a half ago and the migraines got really bad that I decided that I, I needed to go off of work um, to, to really deal with this and get it under control because I, I was trying to push through and in doing so um, just kind of making everything worse. So I did take some time off work. Um, I, I was ultimately off work completely for approximately eight months. Um, and during that time, um, the first few months I was on the unemployment. And then after that, my private insurance from work uh, kicked in. But that's when I really had to go through the ringer in terms of paperwork uh, in order to basically justify that I'm actually sick. Um, and uh, that required a lot of paperwork on the part of, it was my family doctor who was taking care of it at the time. So she um, had to fill out enormous amounts of paperwork, um, really justifying her own diagnosis of what was going on, which to me is a little bit ridiculous. Um, and I had to fill out a lot of paperwork and go through interviews with the people at the insurance who were quite rude, um, clearly did not understand what migraine was, 
and um, yeah, basically, eventually it got accepted for me. So I did have coverage for um, a certain amount of time. But every month, you ha I had to check in, and they would ask me questions to evaluate on their terms how I was doing. So they would ask me questions about my ability to do activities of daily living, such as like be able to wash the dishes or get dressed or do these things. And in my case, I don't know if I'm different or if this is everyone. I mean, everyone's different, right? But um, when I was even at my worst, uh, I would go walking and I would walk every single day because exercise for me was a really important part of kind of keeping, uh, I guess, my mental health, but also keeping physically fit because when you're so sick, it's really difficult to do other types of exercise. So I would spend the morning in bed sick to my stomach and I would be like no it's time to go for a walk so I would bring with me my Gatorades and a little plastic bag in case I was sick and I would walk for five kilometers and I would come home and I would do this almost regardless of how I was feeling even if the pain was horrible so um, this was not something that the insurance company liked to hear because I was honest with them and they were like what you can walk five kilometers well why can't you go to work like, well, <laughs> it's a little bit different because when I go to work, my job is um, like very high pressure. It's very busy. I have to be very concentrated not to make any mistakes. I mean, it's, I, I can't go to work when I have like a drill going into the side of my head. Um, so it was a, a big lack of understanding about what migraine can be and how it can present for different people and how people's experiences really change. So um, that was very frustrating, but I was still able to get through that from month to month. And then the most difficult part came when it came to time time to do like a progressive return to work, which um, I had really wanted to do, um, but I didn't want to do it too quickly uh, because I, I knew myself that this would not go well if I if I did too much at once. So um, I wanted to go slowly things were going pretty well i was handling work great my migraines were more under control and then the following month when i had to do that check-in with them uh they uh they didn't like that because they're like oh well if you can do two days a week at work why can't you do three i'm like well because it's touchy right if i'm doing really well now and i'm progressing i'm getting better like you can't sort of force it to happen right now that I'm going to suddenly no longer have migraines. So um, it had been agreed upon with my doctor that it was a good idea to keep going slowly, but the insurance company was pushing, 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 um, demanding all these expert, like, expert um, opinions from like my neurologist, my internist, and all this. And I got so tired and so frustrated that I just said, you know what, I don't want this anymore. So I just... I gave up. I told the disability that I a disability insurance, but I just didn't, wasn't interested anymore. So that's really sad because it's something that I have a right to through my work. I pay for it. I I should be entitled to this, and it was something that was supported by my doctor. But when you're sick and you're tired, the last thing you want to do is argue with an insurance company. Um, so I really think there's a lot of education to be done with them based on like what migraine is and have it truly recognized as a disability and not just something that is just a headache. I don't know. Um, and <laughs> make this process a little bit less, um, like, I guess, traumatic for patients who are already dealing with a lot. So um, I know that with Migraine Canada, you are starting to address this in your work. So that's really fantastic to hear. Yeah, I mean, I, I've heard the story and I've accompanied so many uh, uh, other people. I'm, I'm so glad to have you here to verbalize this very honestly and very transparently as it is, right? Because those are things that people sometimes feel very ashamed of and they shouldn't because quite frankly, I've seen so many people um, work in very poor conditions you know, being very sick, pushing through, being exhausted, chopping everything in their family lives and personal lives so they could go to work. And so I, one of the worst stigma on migraine patients is that they are lazy and weak. And that's the worst because what I see in my office, sometimes I see patients, my tears go to my eyes because I have migraines myself and I cannot imagine 
working full time with 25 days of migraine because when I have one, I, I'm curled in my bed, right? Mm -hmm. So, so I think that's something we should work on. Uh, to be fair to the insurance companies, the problem is we don't have a biomarker, which means we don't have a proof, right? We don't have blood levels or imaging things or, and the diaries are still, you know, still filled by someone. So um, I think hopefully in the future, we can get some degree of marker for migraine. That would be a great hope. But in the meantime, uh, you're right, we have to explain to, to the uh, insurance companies and also the employers that people with migraine, you know, sometimes can need some adaptations mm -hmm. and uh, especially even before they're disabled, you know, just having access to water or just, you know, having a no sense policy in the workplace. There's so much we can do to improve the, the work productivity of, of people because the last thing people do really are, are being on full disability because most of my patients like yourself, they want to work because it's good for them because they, because they have training and expertise like you. And they say, well, you know, I, I love my work, but it's just, I can't do five days. So, um, so there's a lot to be done. And now we're looking into uh, discussing with lawyers and experts in disability and just trying to understand the system, right? How does it work? And in the States, for example, a migraine was not listed in, as a disability cause. So what patients had to do was to get a diagnosis for depression or fibromyalgia or other pains because migraine could not work. So, um, so I think that we, we've covered a lot of ground here and uh, thank you so much for sharing uh, what you went through because that's just by talking about that, then we can see the problems and we can address them. Uh, and I, I really hope with Migraine Canada uh, that we can work on this. So, uh, so Shelley Duval, winner of the uh, fifth annual contest for short movie of Migraine Moment. Have a look, go online. Um, and then we are working. So please uh, go on our Facebook, go on migrainecanada.org. You can sign our petition, uh, which is mostly just collecting names and emails and also some support for our actions that include a lot of what Shelly and I have been discussing today. So uh, I wish you all uh, to be well, to enjoy the summer to the best, and to our next uh, series of webinars and interviews during the fall. Please comment, share, and be well. Thank you, Shelly. I'll see you around. We'll keep working together for sure. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you.